Hare Krishna. Thank you all of our viewers out there for being patient. And uh, we had uh, our previous program went a little longer than expected. And I'm so, so glad to have my dear, dear friend Krishna Chaitra Maharaj, who I've known uh, for 40 years, I guess, more than that. I, I think we first met in uh, Rainy Park, I remember. Yes, <laughs> that sounds right. <laughs> yeah, we, we had a great time there. Um, so we are so much pleased. Let me just say a few words before we introduce you and, and uh, introduce today's topic uh, to just talk a little bit about this whole program. Uh, that we're doing with uh, the GBC strategic planning team. We are conducting 35 days. We, we started it with Advaita Acharya's appearance day. We're going to go all the way through to Gaur Purnima, and we're going to have every day at least one, if not two, maybe three uh, different broadcasts so that we can dive deeply into Sri Chaitanya Charitam Rita and uh, try to connect with that and, 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 relish it from every angle uh, so we invite our audience to please stay tuned make sure if you're not already subscribed to uh, to any of our lists to our facebook page or our youtube channel or particularly our mailing list because our mailing list uh, we send out every day a, a, a broadcast schedule what's coming up it's really the best way to keep on top of this uh, this great event so that's my pitch <laughs> now for today in our efforts to really connect deeply with Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita we have turned to you Maharaj to help us uh, get a little idea about the historical impact but I'd like to first ask you I mean you are now aware this this is uh, uh, <laughs> it's I'm a beautiful in, looking place I'm in I'm in the middle of Poland. Uh, I'm in a place in the country, right next to a huge forest. Uh, and yes, it is a very, very nice, peaceful place. I've been sort of hiding out here since last June with the pande pandemic. Uh, so yeah, that's where I am. Um, but it, I'm kept quite busy while i'm here with as as i think all of us are um with online events and so on yeah yeah i mean this is uh, something that we're realizing now in, in doing all of this is that a new world has opened up in in one sense for us in terms of our online outreach and online activity online relationships and that we're going to have to really l learn go into this deeply and, and figure out how to make, uh, to, like Srila Prabhupada was always keen to use technology to enhance our service to Krishna. Um, I, we, we asked you particularly to, to help us in looking at the history because you have a academic uh, background. You're a, you're a professor or you've been a professor, uh, have, a, have a doctorate from, from Oxford. Uh, and uh, you've studied a lot of these topics from an academic perspective. Um, well, <laughs> that may be an exaggeration. Um, I'm not so much a historian, in fact, but uh, there are historians of our tradition that I've consulted in the last few days uh, just for this event, so I hope I can share some of uh, of what they have gathered. So, because we are we, we started a little late, um, I I prepared a, a, a bit of a set of you know some some questions to kind of lead us along, and mm -hmm. so I I thought we should just begin before we get into the history of the CC, the Chaitanya Charitamrita itself, perhaps you can give us a little of the context of the time, the, 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 period, the historical period in which uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita appears. Uh, that's, I yeah. thought that would be a great place to start. Okay. Uh, first, though, let's, um, let's sanctify the atmosphere with some yes. 
Pranati. <laughs> oh. Oma jnana timrandasya gnanjana shalakaya chakshurun militam yena tasmai shri gurave nama shri chaitanya mano bishtam stapitam yena bhutale svayam rupakadamahyam dadati svapadantikam nama om vishnu padaya krishna prishtaya bhutale shimate bhakti vedanta swamin Iti namine. Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vancha Kalpa Trubyascha Kripa Sindhubya Evacha Patitanam Pavanevyo Vaishnavevyo Namo Nama Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Advaita, Gadadhar, Shri Vasadi, Gauravakta Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So I am first of all want to express my gratitude for this opportunity. Uh, to share with all of you uh, in preparation for the celebration or as part of the celebration of the appearance of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Uh, and yes, we want to uh, look at the historical impact of Chaitanya Charitamrita. All we can really do is a bit of sketching of some of the contours uh, of this topic. And to get an idea of the, the historical situation, we're talking, first of all, about the 16th century, according to the Western calendar, 16th century of what's now called the Common Era. Uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's uh, wo wonderful pastimes have uh, been taking place uh, from the later part of the 15th century into the first third of the 16th century. And during that time, he has sent uh, a few of his especially learned followers to Vrindavan uh, to settle and there to establish the theology and the practice of uh, what will come to be recognized as Gaudiya Vaishnavism or Chaitanya Vaishnavism. Uh, and so he sends uh, these, they come to be known as generally the six Goswamis, although actually there were, uh, you can say seven or even eight Goswamis, uh, Srila Rupa Goswami, she. Sanatan Goswami, Srila Jiva Goswami, Gopal Bhatta Goswami, uh, Srila Raghunath Das Goswami, Srila Raghunath Bhatta Goswami, and also um, Lokanath Goswami was there, and um, others. Uh, and their, their mission was, number one, to revive uh, or to... to excavate, sometimes the word is used, uh, the, the, uh, the transcendental realm of uh, Lord Krishna's pastimes, Raja, uh, Raja Vrindavan, and at the same time to establish uh, the practice of Krishna consciousness, especially through their writings. And all of their writings were uh, being done in Sanskrit language. They were writing in Sanskrit. They were, they were writing in Bengali script. Uh, if you go to the Vrind Vrindavan Research Center, uh, Vrindavan Research Institute, which is near the Krishna Balaram Mandir uh, in Vrindavan, uh, you can see when they put on display, you can see some of the beautiful handwriting 
of Srila Rupa Goswami uh, in Bengali script, but they were writing Sanskrit. Uh, and one of the questions that one may ask is why were they writing in Sanskrit? Well, they were writing for the for the learned, for uh, this was the Sanskrit was the lingua franca uh, of the learned of India. And their purpose was to um, establish the, the authority of the teachings of Lord Chaitanya. And that required uh, that they write in, in Sanskrit. Uh, there was also a Brahmin community in Mathura, a very ancient community of Brahmins, um, who were worshiping the Lord as Varahadev. There are two, two temples of Varahadev there, I understand. Uh, and so they may have had them sort of immediately in mind, but also um, Varanasi, or Banaras, uh, the pundits of Banaras, certainly they would have wanted to address them. Uh, and so all of this, um, with, in this context, they were at the same time aware that writing in Sanskrit is not going to, um, it's not going to reach the wider public whom they certainly also wanted to reach and whom Chaitanya Mahaprabhu certainly wanted to reach. Um, the, the whole spirit of his mission uh, was clearly to spread uh, the practice of Krishna consciousness, the chanting of the holy names uh, everywhere to everyone. Uh, and in particular, they were concerned with uh, reaching the people of Bengal, um, especially considering when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu departed the world in 1533 or 34, some say 33, some say 34. Um, after his departure then, how to continue uh, his legacy. This was the big question. Now, I have to say, uh, for those of you who may be now wa watching, who also attended uh, His Grace Hari Parshad Prabhu's very won wonderful presentation yesterday, uh, that he explained um, these points very, very nicely, how Krishnadas Kaviraj was recognized to be so uh, profoundly qualified uh, to take up the task, which the Goswamis saw the need, the Rindavan Goswamis saw the need uh, to, to fulfill. And so sometime later, Krishnadas Kaviraj came to, came to Vrindavan. Uh, it's estimated probably in the year 15, 54, between 54 and 57. Uh, he, he was a young man at the time. He stayed, he remained in Vrindavan for the rest of his life. Uh, he lived apparently into his 90s. Uh, and um, he is well respected aside from uh, his writing of Chaitanya Charitamrita, which was his last work. He's especially celebrated for his Sanskrit work, the Govinda Lilamrita. Uh, but uh, he took up uh, with full dedication the writing of Chaitanya Charitamrita. Uh, as we know from the work itself, he writes how he is uh, concerned whether he will be able to finish. He describes himself as being quite elderly. He says his hands are shaking. He does not know will he be able to complete it. Um, but as we all know, and this is what one of the things we're celebrating uh, in all these discussions, 
is that he very much indeed uh, completed the Chaitanya Charit Amrita, uh, a work uh, which has been referred to by one scholar, Tony Stewart, who uh, has researched extensively on uh, the biographical works uh, pertaining to Mahaprabhu, he referred to Chaitanya Charitamrita as the final word um, for the Gaudiya Vaishnavas in many respects. Uh, it became the final word, the authoritative word on uh, the theology of who is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and how does one practice uh, how does one practice Krishna Bhakti following Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? Now, I think it's also important to uh, be aware that uh, by the 16th century, the Srimad Bhagavatam was very much uh, recognized in Bengal as. Um, as an important work, as an authoritative work. It was celebrated already in poetry, in uh, performative arts, and so on, especially the 10th canto. Uh, and the recognition of uh, the Srimad Bhagavatam is an important background because what we, one way of understanding or appreciating the Bhagavatam, sorry, the Chaitanya Charitamrita, is uh, that it is a commentary on the Bhagavatam, which is of a very special type because it is simultaneously uh, telling the life of the ideal reader of the Bhagavatam, namely Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Mm. Yeah. So it's, uh, in this respect, a very powerful work. Uh, I'm going to ask you to, to describe a little bit more about the, the environment in the Gaudiya community. Uh, we know that Krishnadas Kaviraj leaves Bengal uh, on basically on the order of Nityananda to go to Vrindavan. But at that time, he's not uh, actually going there to, to write or to compose, but he's going there because he's ordered to. And then he arrives and then on the order of Govinda, practically speaking, uh, he, he begins this, this work. But tell us a little bit about the environment in the Gaudiya community at this time. You, you mentioned now that that the Chaitanya Charitamrita becomes the final word. Is that means that there was mm -hmm. some kind of debates going on or you know, like, like we see in, in Christianity, we, we see how there was uh, in the early days of, of, uh, of the, after Jesus's uh, departure, there was lots of debate going on about him. Was that also the situation? And I, I'm going to let you take the, the full screen right, while I listen. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, uh, my understanding is that this is uh, very much the case. How much explicit debate was going on, um, I couldn't say, but there were different views about, as you mentioned, the identity of Jesus in Christianity, there were different views about the identity of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Um, it was generally understood. Uh, all of his followers had this idea. Rindavan Das Thakur, uh, who, of course, wrote, uh, he's identified by Krishnadas Kaviraj as the Vyasa uh, of Chaitanya Lila. Uh, Vrindavan Das identifies Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as an avatar, as an avatar of Vishnu, of Krishna, 
Um, others have similar ideas. And mm, we have to we have to remember that uh, we're talking about the 16th century. The the amount of communication that's going on, the speed of communication that's going on, is nothing like what we have today. Um, and so there were different communities of Gaudiya Vaishnavas congregating in different uh, towns and villages with different leaders, each of whom had their own understanding uh, of, um, well, of who is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in particular. And we get a hint of that in, um, what is it, chapter chapter 6, Adi Lila of um, Advaita Charya and his followers. And Krishnadas Kaviraj mentions that Advaita Charya had, was it six sons? And three of the sons are um, understanding who is Chaitanya, and three of them are not understanding. They, they, they don't recognize him. And uh, Krishnadas uses very strong language. He refers to them as asara as, as uh, well, deviated, non-essential, literally. So there were different I ideas floating about in, in Bengal. Uh, and at the same time, there was, there was a sense that uh, Sri Chaitanya is central, but, yes, but in what respect and in what relation, especially with regard to Advaita Charya and Nityananda Prabhu. So, so one of the things... Yeah, um, just go ahead, I'm sorry. Well, one, one of the things we see uh, Krishnadas Kaviraj doing in Adi Lila in chapters 8 and 9, he gives us uh, the what he calls the Chaitanya tree. Of, yes. uh, of Krishna Bhakti, uh, which is a wonderful extended metaphor in which uh, there is an organic interconnection amongst, yeah, br branches and sub-branches with Chaitanya as the trunk and the nine sannyasis as the roots and uh, Madhva, uh, and Madhavendra Puri as the seed, and then the branches, the sub-branches, Saka, Upasaka, and so on. And what he does with this is he integrates everyone in, a, in very particular relationships. And it seems that as a result of this, everyone kind of said, oh, okay, yes, this is how we all relate. <laughs> Whereas prior to that, they they didn't know. Unifying force. Yeah, it was unifying, and at the same time, it was acknowledging uh, these different branches and uh, seeing them as um, as bearing as fruit bearing and so on. Um, now you 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 mentioned that uh, this was not. The time of internet there was not the time of printing presses i mean the, it was yeah so book but books were being written the, the goswamis were writing and now krishna Kaviraj, first of all he's written he's writing in bengali so that's another thing maybe you could you could tell us about because you you mentioned how the the goswamis were writing in sanskrit was mm -hmm. there but here we have krishna Kaviraj writing in bengali um and what's the expectation? How are these? Is there sort of an idea that this, these writings are now going to be disseminated? That this is not just uh, something, you know, uh, what do you call it? A, a hobby. I'm going to write this down for my own sake, but that I'm writing right. it for the world and it's going to go out. How, how, how did that how did that take place during these these times? <clears throat> 
Uh, manuscripts were copied. Uh, this, this is a standard procedure. And uh, it's, it's, a common, it's a common practice now of scholars when they are examining manuscripts of anything in particular uh, to, to note how many different copies of a particular manuscript there are, uh, because that's an indicator of how popular uh, that particular text was. So for example, the Mahabharata, there are probably thousands of copies, manuscripts of the Mahabharata throughout manuscript collections in and beyond India. Um, they're not all identical. That's another subject. Uh, the uh, works of the Goswamis, how many, for example, of Jiva Goswamis, Shatsandarvas, I can only say that, <clears throat> that when Radhika Raman Prabhu uh, was doing his doctoral study at Oxford on the Paramatma Sandarbha, he um, visited various libraries, appropriate libraries in India to find manuscripts, he was uh, able to locate six manuscripts of which he was able to get copies for his work. Uh, there were more of, there were more than that, but he was only able to access uh, six for his own work. Um, so that's a kind of study in itself to, to see how many copies of different works uh, have, have survived and where they have ended up. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the sort of, uh, how to say, the, um, the dynamics of how manuscripts have traveled uh, can be an interesting subject. But certainly the idea was that they would be copied and copy means by hand, letter by letter, uh, line by line. So it was quite a ordeal for this to happen. And, and the, the, the first copies, or I, I assume they were copies, not the originals, uh, are dispatched to Bengal with a, a whole trove of uh, Goswami literature. And we know that there's the whole story of, of it uh, being stolen and, and so on. Yeah. Uh, was, was that like the, that, that must've been somewhere in the, in the plan. Okay, where uh, this is being <laughs> written, now let it go out, book distribution. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> yeah, you would think so. Um, all that we, all that we have, um, we do have this story. There are two versions uh, of this quite dramatic story. One from the 17th century, uh, the Prema Vilasa, of one Nityananda Dasa, uh, who was a follower of uh, Janava Devi, and therefore a follower of Nityananda Prabhu. Uh, the Prema Vilas gives the, you can say, the, uh, the first account of that story. And then um, several decades la later, in the, I think, early 18th century, uh, we have Narahari Chakravarti Thakur's um, Bhakti Ratnakar account, in which he does uh, some, well, uh, dare I say, embellishment on uh, the description of Nityananda Das. Uh, and in any case, the, the story is that it was Jiva Goswami who commissioned Srinivas Acharya to uh, go to, rent to Bengal. Um, he uh, was accompanied by Narutam Das Thakur and Shamananda Prabhu. And um, they had two wagons, <laughs> two ox carts, apparently, uh, full of manuscripts. And they had 10 uh, guards, armed guards with spears and so on. 
and um, they tra they traveled all the way uh, to what is south southwestern Bengal, and then in a place near to Vana Vishnupur. Vishnupur is a a town uh, in I think it's the Midnapur district, southwest. <clears throat> they stopped overnight uh, after going through the Jarikan forest and re remembering how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had traveled through that forest. They emerge and they come into southwestern Bengal. And um, after, after uh, a night, uh, apparently what was a peaceful night, the next morning they wake up to find uh, that the, uh, the all of the manuscripts are gone, completely gone. And uh, the story is very dramatic in at least, uh, I think it's Prema Vilas version, uh, that <laughs> it had not been copied, but rather this was the only, uh, this was the very edition of, Krishna as Kaviraj that he had personally written was now lost. And the story goes that um, Srinivas, feeling totally devastated, wrote a message to Krishna as Kaviraj in Vrindavan reporting what happened. And then the story goes, and this may this must this may be a apocryphal story, but that he read this note, he was so devastated. Very soon after this, he gave up his life uh, in this thinking that all of his work had had been for naught, had been lost. Well, as we know, this story has a happy ending uh, in that um, Srinivas eventually finds the manuscripts. He meets uh, Rajbir Hambir. Uh, the the local chieftain, some referred to as a king, but something of a chief, something of, of a robber baron apparently, and he is portrayed, um, I believe it's by um, Narhari Chakravarti Thakur. He is portrayed as he is being he's compared to uh, Jagai and Madai. Um, so it's a kind of parallel made that, um, long story short, Srinivas Acharya converts Rajbir Hambir. Uh, he has a profound change of heart as Srinivas corrects uh, the pundit who is uh, attempting to describe Krishna Leela in the court of Rajbir Hambir. Um, when Srinivas stands up and begins to correct the pundit and, and describe Krishna's pastimes, Krishna Lila, the Rasa Lila, uh, with the proper understanding, uh, so we are told Raj, hum, Raj Bir Hambir uh, becomes overwhelmed. He has a change of heart. Uh, and Srinivas Acharya becomes his guru. Uh, and then as soon as he sees, as soon as the manuscripts are recovered, he understands the need that uh, they be copied. And so we are told that under the sponsorship of Raj Bir Hambir, um, that Chaitanya Charitamrita was copied, that copy, copyists uh, were engaged, and several copies of Chaitanya Charitamrita uh, were made on the spot, apparently in Vishnupur. Uh, and then these copies, these were the, this was a, a substantial number, no no number is given, but a substantial number so that it would indeed survive uh, and uh, be distributed to the, yeah, the important leaders of uh, the 
Gaudiya Vaishnava communities in Bengal. So, do we have an idea that th this is uh, so? This is arriving in Bengal. We know that there's a the grand Ketari Gorpurnima festival takes place sometime after this. And do they sort of appear there and uh, everyone receives them, or do we, do we know anything about what happens after that? Um, I won't say much about the Ketari Gram festival because. Uh, Mother Sitala is going to give a yes. whole talk yes. on that subject, <laughs> I think, yeah. in a couple of days. <clears throat> uh, the, but I will say it was an event of consolidation uh, uh, organized by Narottam Das Thakur, of course. Uh, he was originally from, from Ketri Gram, uh, and uh, he... Um, he organized this festival. It was mainly him who did the, the organizing, sending messages all, all over Bengal uh, and bringing them all together. And certainly this and further festivals like it would have been times when the message uh, or the teachings of the Goswamis of Rindavan would have been uh, preached, they would have been lectured, they would have been discussed, and particularly through the Chaitanya Charitamrita, because the Chaitanya Charitamrita was uh, summarizing the teachings, it was also quoting the teachings, there are several uh, verses quoting uh, straight from uh, Srila Rupa Goswami's writings, um, but with the Sanskrit, of which there are some 1,500 verses uh, within the Chaitanya Charitamrita, and then uh, the Bengali translation and, in effect, commentary on those verses, all of that would have been discussed uh, in these, in these uh, festivals. Um, now... It's been explained by one uh, very respected contemporary scholar, Professor Amiya Sain. I think this is a nice point to be aware of. He says that um, prior to British times in India, there were basically three issues among or in relation to Gaudiya Vaishnavas and Gaudiya Vaishnavism, uh, the first issue that uh, he says was essentially resolved by the Vrindavan Goswamis was to establish bhakti as a, an independent rasa um, in, in the tradition of rasa theory aesthetics theory, Sanskrit aesthetics. Uh, there were debates that were going on uh, for centuries and millennia over uh, what are the principal rasas and so on. And the idea of a separate or independent bhakti rasa is established by the Goswamis, especially, of course, Srila Rupa Goswami. Then the second issue and this is the one which is of big concern in Bengal in particular, is the relation between Krishna Paramyavada and Gora Paramyavada. Uh, the Vada, the doctrine of supremacy, Paramya, of Krishna on the one side, and of, Krish of Goranga, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, on the other side. What is the relation of these two? Um, Professor Sain argues that this was established essentially by Krishnadas Kaviraj. Uh, there was a third issue which is taken up in 
uh, the next generations, especially by Vishwana Chagavardi Thakur and Baladevidya Bhushana, is the issue of the integration of uh, the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition with the pan Indian Vaishnava sampradayas. Uh, and of course, that goes uh, into uh, uh, a slightly different tangent, but this was going, this was this issue was going on uh, in particular in the 18th century. Uh, and uh, the it goes eventually to the court uh, of Jai Singh II in Jaipur or in Galta near Jaipur. Um, yeah, that's another story. But this um, this issue of Paramyavada, Krishna Paramyavada, and Gora Paramyavada. This is being resolved by Krishna Das Kaviraj in his Chaitanya Charitamrita. And then this is being discussed in uh, the assemblies of the Vaishnavas, such as the Ketri Gram, the first Ketri Gram festival. Now, we know though. Or let's let's fast forward a little bit, <laughs> but maybe you can fill in the gaps because, and, and talk about the 19th century, and the position of Chaitanya Charitamrita after the 18th, when it somehow it becomes a bit obscure, it seems. Um. Yes, uh, it's. This is an area which is, uh, for myself, also uh, rather fuzzy. We do have information from the 19th century about uh, the beginnings of the printing of Chaitanya Charitamrita. Um, what we can say before this is that uh, along with or somewhat yeah, we can say parallel to uh, what we may want to call the orthodox understanding of the Goswamis of Vrindavan as established in uh, the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Uh, ironically, and we may say rather disturbingly, uh, the uh, various other groups, uh, the Sahajiyas, the Aulas, the Baulas, and others, Kartabhajas, they also took the Chaitanya Charitamrita as their authority for justifying their theologies or philosophies, if you like. Um, and how they would do this was by selective, uh, by extraction from Chaitanya Charitamrita, uh, various uh, verses and passages which suited them uh, for justifying their uh, understandings, or we may want to say their misunderstandings <laughs> uh, of what is, uh, what is Krishna Bhakti, what is Krishna Consciousness. So this was going on um, in 17th and 18th centuries, and uh, into the 19th century. And it's these sorts of, um, of groups in particular whom uh, we can say our Srila Kedarnath Bhaktivinoda Thakur uh, is very concerned to address. And then also Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Thakur uh, to address and to counter through their very strong uh, preaching. But the point I want to make here is we should be aware that all of them are grounding their positions on the Chaitanya Charitamrita. But how they're doing it is they are being selective, uh, taking passages uh, extracted out of the Chaitanya Charitamrita and therefore not, um, not, uh, not seeing 
the whole picture uh, the of the mood of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, uh, his very strict uh, attitude and behavior as a sannyasi uh, in Puri, especially they they kind of put that all aside uh, and ignore it. So that was that was going on, um, and all of these um, what Krishna sorry what. Bhaktivinoda Thakur would call apasampradayas, they all have their texts. They have, they've been busy doing their own writing. Uh, they have their own shastra, so to speak. Uh, and uh, it is very much going back, uh, or they're basing it on Chaitanya Charitamrita. Now, okay. before we go into the 19th century. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, Sorry. I have an, a bit of interesting uh, information from the early 18th century uh, concerning the, there was another controversy, a very strong controversy, whether Parakya Bhava or Svakya Bhava is to be understood as, as the right or the, the, uh, the proper um, the higher understanding of Krishna Bhakti, of ultimate Krishna Bhakti. This was a subject of debate uh, from, yeah, uh, the, the 17th century. But in the 18th century, 1717, there's a date, uh, they actually held court in Bengal in the court of Nabab Zafar Khan, who was the Muslim governor at the time? Uh, the uh, the pundits, the the Bengali pundits, held a debate, and um, in this debate, uh, there was one Krishna Dev Bhattacharya, who was a disciple of Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur, who of course promoted. Maybe I shouldn't say of course, but he. He um, proclaimed Parakya Baba, or the relationship of non-marriage uh, of Krishna and the gopis as the highest uh, relationship. Um, his disciple Krishn, Krishnadev Bhattacharya, or Krishnadev Sarvabhama Bhattacharya, um, came to Jayapur and was convinced by the king, uh, Jai Singh II, uh, that he should promote, promote Svakya Bhava. And why he should do that, well, uh, the king had his purposes. He wanted to establish himself as <clears throat> the Dharmic king and he felt it was necessary. Apparently, there were some of these sahajiya practices going on within his realm, influenced from the Bengalis, who were basing their uh, arguments on the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Um, so he, Krishnadeva Bhattacharya, was sent to Bengal to argue, to debate with. Uh, the uh, the Bengalis who were promoting Parakya Rasa. And in the process, Krishnadeva Bhattacharya lost. <laughs> and he came back to Jaipur to report to the king. He said, I'm sorry, but they've actually, they have a stronger argument. And the king was not happy with this. Uh, some years later, he was uh, Krishna, Krishna Deva Bhattacharya apparently was sent again to Bengal. Again, they had a debate. Again, he was defeated. So all of this is going on within the context of the authority of the Goswamis of Vrindavan, which had been communicated through Krishnadas Kaviraj's Chaitanya Charitamrita. Yeah. 
<laughs> exciting, it's, uh, dramatic. Uh, and the debates still go on, I, I assume. You know, oh, yeah. Still, uh, <laughs> Well, Sheila Bhaktivin Othakur said, there's no debate, they're complimentary. They're complimentary, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so tell us more about Bhaktivin Othakur, because we, we and, and his discovery, the influence of Chaitanya Charitamrita, because we're, we're talking about the historical impact, and that's certainly historical. Yes, okay. Uh, do we have time? We can extend. We, we started late because of the okay. late conclusion of our earlier program. So we at least have another 10, maybe 15, 20, 15, 10 minutes at least. And then okay. uh, but we should also ask if, if people have questions, you can start putting them in our comment stream and we'll get to those afterwards. OK. Um, so to appreciate, I mean, this is a whole discussion in itself, Bhaktivinoda Thakur. Uh, you know, <laughs> there's so much that can be said uh, about Bhaktivinod Thakur's early um, preaching. Um, but the context of Srila Bhaktivinod Thakur, of course, we're coming into the time of uh, colonial presence. Um, and we know Bhaktivinod Thakur himself was in uh, his his. His, um, his profession, he was uh, a district uh, magistrate under uh, the British rule and so on. Um, but of course, his heart was with uh, the teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, which he came, became familiar with when he was... Um, around 30 years old as he was stationed in Dinajpur. Now, of course, we're speaking historically. Uh, some will object and say, you know, Srila uh, Bhakti Thakur is an eternal associate of the Lord. Uh, he's identified as a manjari and so on. Yes, all of that is there. And simultaneously, he lived in this world in a particular uh, historical context, uh, which I think makes it all the more, we can appreciate him all the more. Within that context, um, early 19th century, there began um, a kind of self-consciousness amongst, uh, amongst what came to be called the Hindus, and they were becoming more consciously identifying themselves as Hindus, and they felt the need to uh, rejuvenate, revive, and uh, in some ways reform their practices. And they began also organizing, famously, the Brahmo Samaj uh, of the early 19th century was established. Uh, there were also um, village organizations called Hari Sabhas, and there was um, something called the Sanatan Dharma Sabhas, and then there was also a Goranga Samaj uh, in the late 19th century, which began to subsume the Hari Sabhas um, within its uh, a larger network. Uh, and this included also Odisha, not only Bengal. Um, so we're talking now about Bhakti Thakur, who in the year 1868, um, this is after 1857, 58 um, by 10 years, which is a hugely important historical time uh, the so-called Sepoy Mutiny had taken place, what's now generally called the First uh, War of Independence um, in India. Uh, the relationship with the British has changed significantly, and there's a stronger uh, impetus to reestablish um, Indian identity, Bengal identity 
and religious identity. And I have a quote from Bhaktivinoda Thakur about the Hari Sabhas. He said, these Hari Sabhas have not been able to effect much change to reform the hearts of the youth due to their propaganda of mixed beliefs, Mishra Mata. Instead, they became a laughingstock, Hasyaspada. Pious ascetics were saddened and lost their enthusiasm at this outcome. It was through Mahaprabhu's grace that they were organized under a sabha named Vishva Vaishnava Sabha. And of course, this was uh, the uh, institution of Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur, which was inspired by Srila Jiva Goswami's Vishva Vaishnava Raja Sabha. Um, now, Bhaktivinoda Thakur mentions uh, that he found it difficult to find a copy of Chaitanya Charitamrita. Uh, but it seems that around this time, 1868-69, he was able uh, to acquire a copy. Uh, it would have been a printed copy, and um, my guess is it could have been printed. I had a reference here. It may have been around uh, the 1850s that that copy was made. Um, Tony Stewart and um, Edward Dimmock found nine different publications of the Chaitanya Charitamrita, nine different printings by different publishers uh, from, I think they said, 1845 uh, until 1870-something. Uh, so the, the Chaitanya Charitamrita was being printed, but I was thinking about it this morning. How many copies would they have printed? My guess is not more than 500 copies. Probably 500 copies would have been a very big print run for them. <laughs> So, uh, in that context, Bhaktivinoda Thakur acquires a copy and eventually writes his Amrita Pravaha Bhashya commentary to Chaitanya Charitamrita, which then uh, his son, uh, Bhakti, who becomes Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Thakur, <coughs> um, publishes. Uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur established his, what he called Bhagavad Yantra in 1913. Uh, so this was just uh, very shortly before uh, uh, Srila Bhakti Nod Thakur's departure. Uh, and he included, Bhakti Siddhanta included in his printing the Amrita Pravaha Bhasya along with his own Anubhashya. Um, let's see, checking notes here. The, so this would have been uh, still, this is all Bengali. I mean, no one has translated yeah. uh, into, well, what to speak of English, what about into other Indian languages? Did Has the CC traveled out of uh, there's a question in fact here from one of our uh, viewers uh, how far did the cc go did it reach the south and upper north india areas uh yeah did, was it contained in bengal do we, do we know about that um I, well it's very likely known but not by me <laughs> so i don't want to <laughs> speculate i'll 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 speculate to the extent that it would very surely have come to Odisha. Um, yes. And I would also expect that it would have gone uh, to the northeast. Um, what is it? Uh, the northeastern Assam and, and Assam, Mega, yeah. yeah, because Chitura. there were... Chitura is where uh, Bhakti Siddhanta himself, he, he went there. We might have carried yeah. it. Yeah, so no, I, mean, I would have expected it was... And, of course, Vrindavan. And Vrindavan, yes. 
Uh, but uh, outside of India, um, well, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur established a Gaudiya Mat in Burma, uh, what is now called Myanmar, right, in Rangoon. Yes. And apparently his main emphasis was uh, the Chaitanya Charitamrita. So it's possible that it, it came to Rangoon. It would be interesting to see also uh, history of Chaitanya Charitamrita in uh, what is now Bangladesh. Yes. So that would in that would involve uh, going to, you know, libraries in Dhaka. Right, right, right. Well, so now we're we're we brought it all the way up. And we are running out of time, so I think we're going to start winding up. But so far, you know, we, and, and we are going to, by the way, uh, explore Srila Prabhupada's historical uh, contribution of Chaitanya Charitamrita in English. Do we know of any English translations that happened before Srila Prabhupada's? I don't know of any translations. There was... <clears throat> Uh, there was uh, some, <clears throat> excuse me, there was uh, one Gaudiya Vaishnava missionary, ba Baba Premananda Bharati, who came to America in 19, um, was it 1902, something like that. And he established uh, a small center in Los Angeles. And it's reported that he would read from Chaitanya Charitamrita. He would tell something from it. Uh, so so this was a harbinger, if you like. It was the beginning. Uh, of course, uh, also, um, Srila Hridaya Bon Maharaj, Bhakti Hridaya Bon Maharaj, uh, went to London and to Berlin and was preaching in the 1930s for two or three years. And he would have uh, been speaking on Chaitanya Charitamrita to some extent. Uh, there's yes. a, a, a scholarly work from, I think, 1925 in English about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu um, from one, what's his first name? I don't remember, Kennedy. Um, and that's about all that I know of from the top of my head. And, so, and today uh, is Chaitanya Charitamrita. I mean, you mentioned uh, Tony Stewart's work, and it's it it's become, I assume, uh, quite a, a a topic for those studying the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition. They would be very much focused on understanding this. Oh, yes. Uh, his work is there. Uh, I should maybe mention he and uh, his his main professor, Edward Dimmock, um, published a full translation of Chaitanya Charitamrita in one volume uh, without any commentary, simply uh, the verses and footnotes and a very extensive introduction. Uh, with Harvard University Press. That was about 20 years ago. Um, so that's available. Um, is there someone scheduled who will be talking about uh, the BBT publishing history? Otherwise, I've managed to do some research on on that, which I could give in about three three minutes. We will connect with you about that because what, we want to do a big special show. We want to bring uh, oh, okay. Rama Shriar and uh, Jayadweta. And, oh, okay. No, uh, they will all know. They will know all of this much better than I do. So <laughs> and, and tell the story, and, and that should be yeah. a great, great show. Um, so yeah. we're working on that. that hopefully, will take place uh, sometimes in the uh, second. Well, yeah, towards the second week of March. Uh, so maybe I can so tell a personal story. Make sure, I, uh, yeah, 
Can I tell a personal experience regarding impact of Chaitanya Charitamrita? Definitely, definitely. So in 1973, Srila Prabhupada was translating the Chaitanya Charitamrita, and he was translating chapter 7 of Adi Lila, and he became very excited that this chapter in particular is so powerful that we should publish this uh, as a separate book. And so it became a separate paperback book called uh, Lord Chaitanya in Five Features. Yes. And uh, do you remember when it came out? I remember it. I don't remember, you know, except that okay. it came out. Well, when it came out, somehow we got a copy. I was in Germany at the time. Somehow we got at least one copy. Maybe we got a few. And we just, we, you know, as we say, we ate it up. Uh, we just became so excited at the descriptions of uh, the Panchatattva plundering the, the, yes. uh, the storehouse of love of God and distributing it everywhere uh, without restriction, without consideration of qualification or non-qualification. We got so excited. I mean, we used to just, you know, rush out to grab our bags of books and rush out the door. We have to distribute these books. Uh, and that was because of Chapter 7, Adi Lila Chaitanya Charitamrita, in this, um, in this single uh, paperback book, Lord Chaitanya in Five Features. Yeah. Great. So we are going to have to wrap up. Um, I think we have, let's see, we have one question here, an interesting question. Um, so I'll just, uh, can you give any example of, because you mentioned this, how the Sahajiyas and, had, uh, and others had misunderstood or taken, you said, taken selective uh, teachings and ignoring others. Uh, mm. I, I, is I don't, that have to do with the Ras Lila and, and things like that? Yeah, I don't have specific verses because I haven't, um, I haven't spent time with this, but uh, they do uh, sort of pick out the description of Ramananda Roy. Uh, when he's in Puri, it's described that he was training, uh, giving dance lessons uh, to the young Devadasis, and that he would personally dress them and so on. And they sort of jump on this and they take, they take this as um, indicating that he was one of them. He was a Sahajiya. Uh, there's been an article written by uh, the late Joseph O'Connell in the Journal of Vaishnav Studies. Um, I mean, that's also maybe 20 years ago. He wrote uh, to refute that argument. Um, he's... He very carefully refutes. He shows how that that can be refuted. Uh, beyond that, just the general, uh, you know, the, the identification of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as Radha or as Radha and Krishna, they sort of extract from that the idea that, well, actually, everyone is either Radha or Krishna. And therefore, we can, um, we can, you know, have this sahajya understanding of, of the oh. physicality of bhakti. <laughs> we can see how Bhakti you know, Thakur felt so elated to find the full Chaitanya Charitamrita and get yeah. the actual message. And yeah. as they say, the rest is history. <laughs> yeah. the, uh, what comes after that and, and what's going on now and what we're doing today uh, yes. with our celebration of the Chaitanya Charitamrita. So we're, yeah. 
we're going to have to end here. Thank you yes. very, very much, uh, Maharaj. Um, Thank you so much. To more. My, uh, I, 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 I'm just looking forward to to more and more of this. Um, we'll 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 find another slot. <laughs> I okay. mean, because this, I mean, this series is going on until uh, Gorpurnima, but the the broadcasting services of the SBT are going on now forever, we hope. Uh, so we want to make this a real service to the society to be able to bring people like yourself and and, and uh, topics like this uh, to, to the wider community. And we do hope that everyone subscribes at gbcspt.com, like this, share it with others, uh, come back tomorrow and the next day and the next day and uh, keep keep with us and we're going to dive deeper and deeper uh there's so much to come we're going to be talking about the the specific specifics of the theology of of the chaitanya charitamrita we're going to get into topics like uh, the uh, inner purposes of mahaprabhu's appearance and we're going to do some fun things like learning about the recipes of of uh, chaitanya charitamrita uh mm -hmm. and, and lots of lots more so please join us. Thank you again, Maharaj. Uh, and thank, thank you so you much. I, I beg forgiveness uh, for any improprieties in what I've spoken. And uh, I beg nothing, for nothing the blessing be of all like the vice. It's Hare. been a great pleasure. Thank you very, very much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.